Um, I just want to get started by talking a little bit about what CCE is. Um, I'm Callie, um, and I'm the GA for on-campus events and civic literacy at the Center for Civic Engagement. Um, our mission at CCE is to encourage students to take an active role in their communities and to foster dialogue. And we do that by putting on events like these and others which allow for discussion and also by encouraging our undergraduate fellows to work closely with some local organizations in Nassau County. Um, this event could not have been possible without uh, support of various people in offices. Um, I'm very grateful to the provost office and to university relations for their continued support. And I'm also indebted to the executive director of the Hofstra Cultural Center, Ethleen Collins, for all of the work she has invested in today's events. I'm also thankful to uh, the center's director, Phil Dalton. I would also like to recognize uh, CCE fellows who have been instrumental in these events, some of whom we have with us today. Finally, I will ask you to note um, a link I will soon post in the chat, and this link will take you to one final event for the day. So if you are interested in attending that, please follow that link. Um, and now I will hand this off to today's moderator, Associate Professor of Political Science, Rosanna Parati. Hi, thank you everyone for coming and thank you uh, to the Center for Civic Engagement for organizing this day of dialogue and to my dear colleagues from the law school and our alumnus, Will Davis, for agreeing to be part of this panel. Uh, my name is Rosanna Parati. I'm Associate Professor of Political Science at Hofstra and I teach courses on political institutions particularly voting in elections and on public opinion. 2020 election comes at a crucial time. It's not an exaggeration to say that democracy itself is on the ballot. The way in which we organize our elections has been threatened by a pandemic that makes it risky to vote in person. Efforts to try and broaden access to voting have faced repeated challenges by one party, most notably from the occupant of the highest office in the land. Yesterday, the Supreme Court refused to revive a trial court ruling that would have extended Wisconsin's deadline to receive absentee ballots to six days after the election, ostensibly contradicting a decision it had made in April, allowing votes cast and postmarked after, before election day to be received days later. The rationale used in the Wisconsin case was that only state legislatures and not the state's courts can make election rules. At least that was what Justice Kavanaugh said. The Supreme Court, including now newly installed Justice Amy Coney Barrett, may have before it additional challenges regarding mail-in ballots in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, and other places. Indeed, even with some half of the number, this is this morning, <laughs> of the number of 2016 ballots already cast in early voting, analysts around the country remain concerned that should one party fail to prevail in the presidential um, and key House and Senate and state races, certification of results will become mired in legal challenges for weeks. We formed this panel to help participants understand the institutional background of these disputes. The framers of the original constitution did not include in the document an explicit right to vote. Now, let's just say a right is a power that can't be taken or what it can't be curbed by the government unless for a very, very good reason. Think here about the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, assembly, these things in Amendment 1 of the Constitution. But neither the original Constitution nor the Bill of Rights contain an explicit right to vote. The original Constitution, which was drafted in 1787, made two allusions to the right to vote. In Article 1, Section 2, where the Constitution talks about the legislative branch, it says, the electors or voters in each state shall have the qualifications requisite for electors or voters of the most numerous branch of the state legislature. So notice that the framers of the constitution here originally gave the states the power to determine who may and who may not vote. Then later in article one in section four, they write the times, places and manner of holding elections for senators and representatives shall be prescribed in each state by the legislature thereof, but the Congress, US Congress, may at any time by law make or alter such regulations. Again, 
Notice that importantly, the state governments are given the primary say-so over how elections are run in the United States, but Congress is given a role as well. Now, of course, the original constitution was written in 1787. That document was amended almost immediately to recognize that people had certain rights that the national government couldn't take away. Freedom of speech, religion, assembly, privacy, legal representation. But the Bill of Rights did not explicitly recognize people's right to vote. It wasn't until 1868 that the long, that long years of injustice and war and protests began to result in the constitutions being amended to recognize the right to vote of a particular of particular groups of people. The 15th Amendment ostensibly gave black men the right to vote. It read in section one, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. And Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. In two subsequent amendments, the 19th ratified in 1920 and the 26th amendment ratified in 1971, women and people aged 18 to 20 were granted the right to vote. States were quite successful in the years that followed the mid 1800s at barring black men from voting, getting around the 15th amendment by using poll taxes, literacy tests and other measures. It wasn't until the passage of the 24th amendment and the Voting Rights Act passed and ratified respectively in 1964 and 1965 that meaningful measures were enacted so that black men and many other disenfranchised minorities might be able to vote. But now I'm getting into the expertise of our panelists. I want to introduce them. The first, uh, and, and I'll introduce them and they'll do their presentations uh, in turn. Our first panelist is Professor James Sample. He's professor of law at the Maurice A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra. Before joining the Hofstra Law faculty in 2009, Professor Sample served as an attorney in the democracy program at the Brennan Center for Justice in New York City at the New York University School of Law. He also worked on Brian Schweitzer's gubernatorial campaign in Montana and clerked for Judge Sidney R. Thomas of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit. Professor Sample has written publications and legal briefs on topics of judicial elections, campaign financing, recusal and voting rights. He regularly comments on voting rights and constitutional issues in leading media outlets, including the Wall Street Journal, the New York Law Journal, Slate.com and the Huffington Post, as well as at national conferences. His work related to democracy has been cited in opinions of the US Supreme Court, articles in the Harvard Law Review, Columbia Law Review and other leading journals and in major media like the New York Times, Washington Post, The Economist, US News and World Report, the LA Times. I'm so delighted to have Professor Sample lead off our panel on voting rights today. And I hand the podium to him. Thank you, Dr. Parati, and it's, it's great to be here. And so in the interest of time, I'm gonna jump right into uh, sharing my screen here uh, with so that we can I, I can show you this PowerPoint presentation on the first topic that is sort of going to tee up Professor Niles a little bit I think uh, and and uh, Will Davis as well and that is the Voting Rights Act that Dr. Parati already mentioned and the Voting Rights Act uh, as she said is passed in 1965 to deal with a range of voter suppression uh, tactics and efforts primarily directed at uh, making it more difficult for black people to vote and especially more difficult in particular jurisdictions. And so the Voting Rights Act and, and Dr. Parati already really mentioned this, but it is intended to enforce in particular the 14th and 15th amendments. And the language that uh, Dr. Parati uh, read already uh, in the 15th amendment is the, the most directly on point language that animates the purposes that were behind this Voting Rights Act. And of course, if the 14th and 14th Amendment is adopted in 1868, we all know that uh, between 1868 and the adoption of the Voting Rights Act, to say that there was the, the 14th and 15th Amendment were not self-enforcing would be an understatement. And it took this effort of Congress at, to even begin really making progress uh, in any meaningful way at suppressing 
vote suppression. Uh, and so that was the purpose of the Voting Rights Act. Now that uh, act has been reauthorized multiple times through the years since 1965. We're not living in 1965 anymore. And the most recent reauthorization of that Voting Rights Act, that incredibly successful piece of legislation, one of the most uh, successful bipartisan, ultimately, uh, efforts of legislation in American history. In 2006, the Voting Rights Act was up for either renewal or to, to sunset. And in 2006, Congress studied the question very carefully uh, as to whether or not the, the need for the Voting Rights Act still existed. Were the harms of racial discrimination in voting practices still harms that needed to be protected against? And to put, when we say very carefully, we forget sometimes, you know, when we think about politicians and, and sort of just casually casting votes, a 12,000 page report uh, in 2006 that was specific to the conditions circa 2006. And Congress elected to extend the Voting Rights Act to renew it for an additional 25 years. Now, just to put this in perspective, in these polarized times that we're living in, right? It seems as though everything these days is red or it's blue. Everything is Donald Trump or Joe Biden. Everything is Democrat or Republican. Well, it, the, the Voting Rights Act was not, at least not in Congress. And in 2006, when Congress voted to reauthorize the Voting Rights Act, the vote in the United States Senate to reauthorize was 98 to zero. That's almost unthinkable today. We can't, we can't pass, uh, you know, American Flag Appreciation Day in the current environment, 98 to zero, but the Voting Rights Act was renewed in the Senate by that margin and almost a, a same, the same statistical margin in the House of Representatives. That, law, that reauthorization was signed without hesitation into law by President Bush, and you can see the luminaries from both sides of the aisle gathered behind him. Why? Because this is such an incredibly successful and important piece of legislation. So what is the portion of which of the Voting Rights Act that is uh, not just in jeopardy, but is no longer in effect? And we'll get to why in just a second. Well, Section 5 of the Voting Rights Act had a, has a provision in it called preclearance. And what preclearance involved is if you were in, if you, a state or county, was a so-called covered jurisdiction, basically if you had a particularly egregious history as a state or county of discriminating in your voting rights practices against persons of color in particular, you were required as a state or county to submit any significant changes to your election and voting procedures to the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice for pre-authorization, right? Prior approval before you can make any of these changes because sometimes if you make the changes and then we find out after the fact that the changes were discriminatory, it's too late. That's the purpose of pre-clearance. So the way in which uh, pre-clearance would be made available, actual clearance in the pre-clearance process, the state or county would have to show that whatever changes they were making to their uh, election process and their processes of voting um, would not have either the purpose or effect of abridging the right to vote on account of race or color. In other words, it shouldn't be that difficult if you're not actually actively discriminating to get the preclearance. And in fact, it wasn't. It's not as though states didn't make changes to their election procedures since 19, between 1965 and 2006. We just had a process in place to make sure that the changes that they were making were not specifically directed at or causing the abridgment of the franchise for persons of color. Is this a permanent life sentence without parole for the covered jurisdictions? No. In fact, many, many jurisdictions were able to get off the preclearance list to basically the same sort of arrangements we have with our children or our students or children have had with their parents. When you're good for an extended period of time, you can get off the list. And so if you were in a covered jurisdiction and you demonstrated years of consistent compliance, and again, what is compliance? Compliance is you, as a jurisdiction, were not actively practicing racial discrimination in your voting practices. If you can't do that for 10 years, you should stay on the list. But if you did do that for 10 years, then you're no longer required to get preclearance. So just to pick one example from around the country, there are zillions of these in covered jurisdictions around the country. But 
11 counties in the state of Virginia that had been in the covered jurisdiction list and had re been required to get that kind of um, pre-clearance that we talked about in section five for their practices, successfully what used what we call the bailout provision um, and are no long, were no longer covered even circa 2013. The, which is to say jurisdictions that got on board with allowing the franchise to be exercised equally on account of race, or at least more equally on account of race, they were able to bail, get, get out of jurisdiction. So this map uh, and the darker colors, and you can sort of see, I mean, the, the darkest colors there are the states that were covered as a whole. Um, the, 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 the sort of red color um, are states where some of the counties in that state were covered jurisdictions. And you'll note that that actually includes New York, which we don't typically think of as you know, part of the Confederacy. It's a reminder that racially discriminatory practices were not um, isolated in the South, though they were certainly concentrated in the South. And so those jurisdictions are the jurisdictions which if you sort of think about this in an analogous sense, they're the ones who had engaged in extraordinarily egregious behavior, the kind of thing that, uh, that Dr. Parati mentioned in her introductory remarks with poll taxes, um, literacy tests, and so forth. Well, in 2013, the Supreme Court um, addressed one of the many challenges that uh, states and counties around the country who were subject to the Voting Rights Act preclearance provisions had brought. And this was Shelby County, Alabama, um, that brought this lawsuit. And by a 5-4 margin, the conservative justices on the court uh, said that the coverage formula, i.e. the formula for determining which states and counties or belong on that list, belong on the section five preclearance list was unconstitutional. Uh, and so we'll get to that in a second, but Shelby County's argument is you know, summarized here in this quote, obviously they go on at some length to, uh, to expand on this argument, but the, the nutshell argument, version of their argument is actually, and this is a verbatim quote from oral argument. They say the problem to which the Voting Rights Act was addressed has been solved. The problem, it, it, there is no longer that problem. In reality though, it's all about framing. The problem to which the Voting Rights Act was, was addressed that was solved if what we mean when we frame the problem is only specific to things like literacy tests, the, the very specific practices and iterations of racial discrimination that were in effect in 1965 when this act was first adopted. If, however, we zoom out, which Congress absolutely did in 2006 when it reauthorized the Voting Rights Act, and if we view the problem not as the specific mechanisms like literacy tests, like poll tests, but as the as racial discrimination in voting practices, then I don't think any of us, especially not in the fall of 2020, need to uh, be reminded that the problem of racial discrimination in voting rights is definitely not a problem that's been solved. That said, uh, during the oral arguments, it was pretty clear, and this was not a huge surprise at the time, um, though the, the outcome of the case was certainly one that was not a foregone conclusion because there was, a, there was certainly hope that Justice Anthony Kennedy might side with the uh, four justices who ultimately dissented in the case. But during oral argument, Justice Antonin Scalia um, offered these thoughts verbatim. Whenever a society, and you can actually listen to the recording of this oral argument, adopts, and he, on the recording you can hear the, the, the intensity with which he says the following two words, racial entitlements. That's pretty close, that's as close as I can do to my Justice Scalia imitation. Um, it is very difficult to get them out through the normal political processes. Well, the racial entitlement, to use his word here, that was being adopted was equality in voting access, non-discrimination in voting practices by states and counties. If that's an entitlement, count me in. So he says, even the name of it is wonderful. This is a verbatim quote, the Voting Rights Act. Who is going to vote against that in the future? Well, it's worth noting that Justice Antonin Scalia is saying these things. He's the ultimate in, in characterizing himself as a judicial minimalist. Let the legislature make the policy decisions, he says. No judicial activism. We shouldn't have judges in robes making these decisions for societies. Judges are not equipped to make those decisions. And yet, 
when Congress reauthorized the Voting Rights Act by the very margin that I showed you a few slides ago, Justice Scalia joins with the majority and here you see picture Chief Justice John Roberts. And he, like the counsel for Shelby County says in essence, things aren't as bad as they were in 1965 which of course the Congress knew in 2006, that things weren't as bad, they weren't precisely the same as they were in 2006, but the Congress still felt that it was worth reauthorizing the Voting Rights Act. Justice Ginsburg writing for the four members in dissent uh, in the court has a famous metaphor, and you can see the image there on the this right hand side of the screen. And it's a, it's a powerful image to explain, to, to articulate her critique and a really powerful critique and one that I quite frankly am very sympathetic to um, with respect to the court throwing out the preclearance provision. She says throwing out this process for preclearance when it has worked and it's continuing to work and in other portions of the opinions she obviously points to the fact that Congress has judged that it's still needed and Congress has judged that it's still working. To stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you are not getting wet. Well, which one of those proved prophetic? Justice Scalia or, and Chief Justice Roberts in the majority or Justice Ginsburg? Immediately after the Shelby County beholder decision, previously covered jurisdictions, it, it was, it was as all, I mean, it was you know, a free for all to enact racially discriminatory uh, voting rights practices around the country. Numerous states enacted rigorous voter, voter identification laws, limited early polling and polling locations. You can look at this map and the, the darker green, uh, the darker the color green, the more restrictive the state voting rights practice uh, and restriction voter ID practice became. You can see that basically, especially if you're looking at the southeastern portion of the United States, uh, basically every one of those states almost to a state adopted a relatively strict or uh, at least, or, or at least modest photo ID requirement. So what happens when that, that turns out to be true? Well, 14 states enacted voting restrictions for the first time in the immediate wake of Shelby County. Numer the, it wasn't just voting uh, voter ID laws. It was also the closure of hundreds per state of polling locations, making it harder for people to access the polls. And in Wisconsin, to give you a sense of what the voter ID law did, 45,000 people were prevented from voting in 2016. 45,000 people is a lot of people. One person is one person too many, but 22,000 votes was the margin in 2016. So these are consequential laws and they're being driven in large part by partisan, uh, to serve partisan ends. North Carolina, and I'm just gonna sort of let these flash, I'm not gonna read them through to, through to you, but North Carolina, just another example. Think, look, all of these separate restrictions immediately in the wake of Shelby County, um, this was all within two months of the, the Supreme Court's decision. Well, if you take all of those restrictions, if North Carolina had still been required to get preclearance, those restrictions would have never passed the preclearance process because they were overly restrictive, they were racially discriminatory in their impact and probably in their purpose as well. Um, but because there was no preclearance, the only way to challenge those laws is through after the fact litigation. And that after the fact litigation proved successful, i.e. the laws that North Carolina it passed in the wake of Shelby County were in fact illegally discriminatory. But the Fourth Circuit, the Federal Court of Appeals in the Fourth Circuit took, it, it was three years until those measures were struck down in the after the fact litigation. And the blue language there at the bottom, without preclearance as a mechanism, illegal voting laws take effect, their electoral consequences are felt, and it's years before they are struck down. So obviously, as Dr. Parati said, all of which is being exacerbated. So 2016 was the first presidential election in the post Shelby County uh, era. All of that is now exacerbated by the circumstances of the pandemic. And there is one glimmer of hope and I'll leave you with that. And that is that um, you see John Lewis there at the podium. John Lewis, uh, before he passed away earlier this year, a lifelong, I mean, just soldier for, 
voting rights and equality had introduced a bill to uh, uh, in Congress to basically renew uh, the Voting Rights Act, albeit in the form of a new piece of legislation that uh, included many of the measures of the old uh, Voting Rights Act and updated them for the modern times. Um, he has he obviously passed away earlier this year. Several senators um, in the Republican controlled Senate have introduced a, a bill similar to the one that he had introduced um, and they have now named it after him. Obviously that bill has gone nowhere in the current Congress or in the current Senate. Um, it has already passed in the United States House of Representatives. Um, but if in fact the opportunity to pass this kind of legislation is there in the next Congress, uh, it would be uh, both an extraordinary achievement and a necessary salve for um, the, the problems that we have. And so a special shout out to my two uh, research assistants at the law school, Nicole and Faith, for um, helping me put this together with the, in terms of the, the uh, PowerPoint portion of the presentation. With that, I will uh, step aside. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Sample. Um, next to Professor Mark C. Niles, Professor of Law, also at the Maurice A. Dean School of Law at Hofstra. Professor Niles teaches and specializes in civil procedure constitutional law, administrative law, and government liability. Professor Niles spent 12 years as a professor at the American University Washington College of Law. The last six of them were spent as professor and associate dean for academic affairs. From 20, we won't hold that against them. From 2010 to 2013, he served as dean and professor of law at Seattle University School of Law. Professor Niles returned to the Washington College of Law in 2013. And in 2019, happily for us, he accepted a position as professor of law at the Dean School of Law at Hofstra. Professor Niles has published many articles and essays on subjects including the Ninth Amendment, federal tort liability, airline security regulation, the impact of dramatic public events on the evolution of regulatory administration, the social and legal consequences of pre-crime incarceration, the depiction of law and justice in American popular culture and tort liability for prosecutorial misconduct. Thank you, Professor Niles. Go right ahead. Let me not be a cliche at the beginning and talk without unmuting myself. So I'll start with that. Um, let me say thanks to everybody. It's a pleasure to be talking about all this. Uh, I'm really very genuinely picking off, taking off from where Professor Sample left off for a couple of ways. One, I'm going to talk a little bit more specifically about exactly what some of the states have done, as he was referencing at the end of this discussion. But maybe even more relevantly, I give full credit to um, the Brennan Center for the information that I gathered over the last couple of days. So either Professor Sample was responsible for telling people to pull this together or helped pull together himself. So uh, he can sort of, I can make that connection. Also, I don't have a PowerPoint, but if folks want to follow along, a lot of what I'm talking about, you can find. Uh, at New Voting Restrictions in America and the Brennan Center, Brennan Center for Justice. If you want to Google that and follow along. So I'm going to talk about some of the things that have happened since Shelby uh, in terms of specific things that states have done as it relates to restricting voting. I'm going to talk a little bit about the arguments about the impact of those things, specifically on poor people and people of color. And I'm going to talk about a couple of my pet peeves that relate to this a little tangentially, but I'll take a little, a little bit of a panelist um, prerogative to talk about the Electoral College and gerrymandering, which also both potentially have significant impacts in diluting the power of the, and the impact of the votes uh, based on uh, people's race and based on people's otherwise class status. So as Professor Sample said, the concern after Shelby County, among other concerns, the central concern was that without the plea clearance procedure, uh, states would, particularly states that were in this uh, history of negative voting rules, but really states all over the country would expand their limitations and restrictions on voting in a, in a uh, partisan way. Again, as Professor Sam Sample talked about, just want to talk specifically about what's happened since 2010 uh, in terms of those specific states. And again, I'm going to go through this. You can take a look at the Brennan Center information if you want to follow this afterwards, or you have any questions about this. So according to the Brenner Center, since 2010, 25 states have enacted new voting restrictions. And this said this a little bit before Shelby County, but certainly after. 
uh, strict voto, strict photo ID requirements and early voting cutbacks are two of the most significant or most common ones of those. Uh, and also registration restrictions on top of voting restrictions. So of these 25, 13, Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Montana, Nebraska, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Ohio, South Carolina, Texas, and Wisconsin. And not to get too specifically political in this area, every single one of these states is either a quote unquote battleground state in the presidential election, or has a disputed, very closely disputed Senate race or both. Uh, they had, of, of these, again, of, of these 25, 13 are in that category. 15 states have more restrictive voter ID laws in place in this period, including six states with strict voter ID requirements. 12 state laws make it harder for citizens to register and stay registered. 10 made it more difficult to vote early or absentee. And three took action that made it harder to restore voting rights for people with past criminal convictions. Many people, I think, are aware of what recently happened in the state of Florida. So again, back to Professor Sample's theme of democracy and the way that it's supposed to work. A state initiative overwhelmingly, I think with well more than 60% passed to return voting rights to felons who had com completed their prison terms in Florida. And the Florida legislature took that law in a very partisan way and added to it a requirement that these same people have fulfilled all of their financial obligations. So any fines or fees that they owed, uh, which impacted well over, I think about half a million voters in the state were impacted by this additional requirement. So just an example of how um, states have restricted this right of former felons to vote. So in 2017, legislatures in Arkansas and North Dakota also passed voter IDs laws and Texas also, Georgia, Iowa, Indiana, New Hampshire also enacted restrictions that year. 2018, so even more recently, Arkansas, Indiana, Montana, New Hampshire, North Carolina, and Wisconsin enacted new restrictions. And in 2019, Arizona, Florida, Indiana, Tennessee, and Texas enacted new restrictions. So many of these states have enacted multiple new restrictions over the last few years. Uh, just to go down to some of the types of restrictions and some of the states that have done them, uh, new restrictions for photo ID laws, Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Iowa, Kansas, Mississippi, Missouri, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, Wisconsin. That's an alphabetical order. Reducing early voting times or restrictive procedures for early voting. So either having less time than they used to have for early voting or different sorts of limitations. So you can only vote early if you were at, out of the state. So Texas imposed some restrictions in that way or other sort of limitations. And this is an even longer list. And I'll read this maybe faster because it's so long. Arizona, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Nebraska, North Carolina, Ohio, Tennessee, West Virginia, Wisconsin, Montana, Nebraska, North Carolina, Ohio, I started in Ohio, sorry, um, Texas, West Virginia, Wisconsin. So restricting or ending voter registration drives. So this is another common thing that many states had direct and active initiatives to try to add to their voter registration rolls. And at least four states, Florida, Illinois, Iowa, and Texas ended those programs or severely restricted them. Uh, limitations on voting for, voting for convicted felons. I mentioned Florida before, but also South Dakota. Purges of voter rolls is another thing I'm not sure Professor Sample mentioned, but another thing that has happened in several states is there's been an aggressive effort to identify voters who either because they haven't voted in a long period of time or for some other reason would be taken off the voter rolls. This has happened in Indiana and Georgia, also in Texas, Pennsylvania, some other places, Ohio. And many, in many of these states, this happens without notice to the voter. So not only are you, are you taking all the voter rolls, but it's done so without any sort of information or notification so that you can attempt to cure it or avoid that application. Uh, limits on regulate, limiting, so limits and regulation for registration, Georgia, Iowa, Kansas, New Hampshire, and Tennessee. Generally, these limitations for registration involved requirements for documentation. So either a documentation that you showed you were an American citizen in order, for, in order to register, or some other sort of limitations were applied, again, in Georgia, Iowa, Kansas, New Hampshire, and Tennessee. So that's a, a range of various things. I could go through each individual state, but I've already talked about it. So I guess, and again, stepping a little bit forward from what we were talking about, what is it about these restrictions that someone could argue have 
either a racially discriminatory intent or a racially discriminatory impact? And I think both are relevant questions, but it seems to me it's easier with the short period of time that we have to talk less about motivations and more about impact. And I think there's a couple of things we can identify. And again, I rely on the Brennan Center for these observations. These aren't things that, I, that just came to my mind. But just some information that relates to these different restrictions that we've talked about and the impact they have on poor people and people of color. So I remember I raised this issue in a course that I taught back in American several years ago, specifically the voter ID issue. And I asked my students a, a show of hands, how many of them thought voter ID regulations were reasonable? And almost all of them raised their hands. And I wasn't particularly surprised. And when I pushed them a little bit, I, I said, okay, so why is it that you think this is reasonable? I think one of the students raised their hand and said, well, doesn't everybody have a driver's license? And my response to that is, well, no, they don't. And not only does not everybody have a driver's license, but the people who don't have driver's licenses throughout the country, they're the sort of racial demographics and, and class-based demographics are very skewed. So all of you sitting in this classroom may have, and everyone that you know and hang out with at parties may have driver's licenses, but that doesn't mean that a, a ID restriction isn't gonna have a negative impact. So specifically 11% of US citizens or more than 21 million Americans based on this estimate do not have government issued photo IDs. So that's 21 million people right off the bat. Obtaining IDs costs money and incur other costs, such as paying for birth certificates or other required documents, Applying for government IDs costs money. Combined cost of documents and travel expenses has been determined to be between $75 and $175. Again, for some people, $175 to get a photo ID, that's nothing. That's what they spend in a week going out to dinner. But for other people, that is a significant impact and a significant barrier to them to be able to do so. Uh, travel required is often a major burden. So a lot of what we talk about impacts people in urban areas. But a lot of the times the impacts of requirements for voter ID have an effect on people based on their rural status and the long distances they have to travel to get these sort of things. Again, no small thing other than waiting in line for someone living in Manhattan to go get a driver's license. It's a different thing altogether for someone in Texas or in Montana or even in Georgia or Utah to get to a place where they could get these things that they would have to have to be able to vote. Uh, voter ID laws reduce voter turnout. A 2014 GAO study found that the strict voter ID laws reduce voter turnout by two to three percentage points, um, which can translate again into tens, tens of thousands of votes in different places. Is two to three percentage points a big deal? Not an election that's decided based on 10 percentage points, but an election decided based on one percentage point, it's a huge deal. And also, as Professor Sample said, any one person being sort of restricted from or dissuaded from voting any two people, any three people is a problem in a, in a democracy. And when we're talking about it in terms of hundreds of thousands, even millions of people, obviously, it's something we have to be concerned about. Again, are there other concerns? Sure, but we have to address the facts and the impact of these sorts of things. Um, so, but I will note, I don't know if it's in the interest of balance, but it's certainly I'm not trying to be unbalanced, but a recent study in 538 website concluded that the impact of voter ID laws has not been large enough in many cases to swing actual elections. Again, I think Professor Sample cited one of the exceptions to that. Very hard not to see in Wisconsin in the most recent election, given the number of people who are restricted from voting and the incredibly small uh, difference in that election. I think many would argue that the Georgia gubernatorial election is another example of a situation where uh, many thousands of people had their voting rights restricted and there was a very small um, a very small margin of error. And again, I think also the Florida gubernatorial election at the same time, similar sort of dynamics. And particularly with the new issues with um, voting for, um, for felons, uh, one can see if Florida is anywhere near as close as it's been in the last three or four presidential elections, the exclusion of four or 500,000 people who otherwise would vote, uh, it's gonna be hard to imagine that that might not have an impact on the election depending on what happens. Okay, so, what about, again, what about, what are the arguments that these things have a particularly strong impact on people of color or poor people? Um, nationally, up to 25% of African-American citizens of voting age lack government IDs as compared to 8% of whites. So again, we can talk about whether that's a motivating reason for these rules, whether the reason why voter ID was chosen as a barrier to voting is based on an intention to discriminate against blacks, 
And again, whether or not we obviously can't prove that or get close to proving that in a limited session like this, but we can identify the specific practical impact. And a quarter of African Americans in this country do not have voter IDs as compared to 8%. And that obviously has a potential impact. Voter ID laws reduce turnout among minority voters. Several studies, including the same 2004 GEO study, found that voter ID laws have a particularly depressive effect on turnout among racial minorities and other vulnerable groups, worsening the participation gap between voters of color and white voters. Um, states exclude ID in a discriminatory manner that studies have found. Um, and you may have, many people who have paid attention have focused on this. States like Texas allow um, gun permits to be a basis for voting, but don't allow student ID cards. Um, until recently, Wisconsin permitted active duty military ID cards, but didn't permit, allow veterans ID cards. And again, in terms of the race-based or class-based determinations, um, it still has an impact in terms of the way people vote. Um, there's also the enforcement of these things are often in a discriminatory manner, but that's a bigger topic. Most studies have shown that most rules and regulations in our society are enforced in a racially discriminatory manner, so this shouldn't be a big surprise with that. Um, and then I guess I do wanna mention, uh, and again, maybe this will be a topic we can talk about more, but uh, voter ID laws are a, a rule in search of a problem should be acknowledged that the only kind of voter fraud that voter ID laws can have any chance of impacting is in-person sort of voter like replacement. So someone showing up in a voting place and saying, I'm Mark Niles, who isn't Mark Niles, and going in and voting instead of me. And the statistics, and they've been sort of bandied about in various ways, but just some specifics. In-person voter fraud is almost statistically non-existent. A recent study found that since 2000, so in the last 20 years, there have been only 31 credible allegations of voter impersonation in the entire country. 20 years, 31 people. And again, that's the only type of voter fraud that the voter ID is going to actually address and potentially affect. Um, again, identified, it's, and most times when there's an issue that is potentially referred to as fraud, in the voter, it's it's a misunderstanding. It is misunderstanding between the person in the voting booth and the person who's talking about it, spelling mistake, various things. Um, also, and finally on this topic, and again, in terms of the broader things we care about as a society and civic engagement, uh, voter IDs are based on this lack of a real issue that the voter IDs are addressing is a remarkable waste of taxpayer dollars. States incur sizable costs implementing voter ID laws, including costs of educating the public, training poll workers, and providing IDs to voters. Texas alone spent $2 million on voter education and outreach efforts following the passage of their voter ID law. And Indiana, a much smaller state, uh, spent 10 million to produce free IDs between 2007 and 2010, just in response to this question. So just a couple of things, and that's sort of the broader issue here, but again, a couple of my pet peeves. Uh, the Electoral College. So in the last five elections, um, three, times the person who has gotten or two out of the last five, uh, the president, the person running for president who got less votes than another person running for president became president because of the electoral college. Not going into it too much, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Basically the electoral college assigns a certain number of electors to each of the 50 states and almost all states, I think except for uh, Maine and Nebraska, have a winner take all um, approach. So if you win a state by 50.0001%, you get 100% of that state's electoral votes. So that alone has remarkable sort of undemocratic properties to it. The other thing, and this is something I confess I did not know until I started looking into this after 2016, not only is that sort of structure problematic, but even the, the numbers of electors is a counter-democratic number and structure. So the electors that you get is pretty simple to determine. It's the number of your uh, congressional representatives plus the number of your senators. So a state with one, so the city where I was born, which has representation, DC has one non-voting representative and we don't have two senators, but they still gave DC three electoral votes. And that's the smallest number that an entity can have. I think the most in the most recent election, so I'm on correctory is 55 for California before the recent redistricting. Mm -hmm. The problem with that is if you compare California to Wyoming, California has 55 electoral votes and Wyoming has three electoral votes. 
it sounds like a lot more for California, right? Except California's population is so much more large than Wyoming's population in terms of that dynamic that the statistics, again, are problematic. So what that does is it diminishes the relative vote impact of someone in a large state like California or New York or Texas or Florida, and it increases the relative vote impact of a smaller state like Montana or Wyoming. Um, and again, will this have a race-based impact? Will it even have a, a class-based impact? It depends because rural voters in California are just as much harmed as urban voters in California are. And city voters in Montana are just as much benefited as rural voters in Montana based on this structure. So again, pet peeve of mine, it seems to me the easiest way to address this, and one of the things that's been proposed is the National um, Popular Vote Initiative, which has proposed that all states agree that they will give all of their electoral votes to the person who wins the popular vote. I'm not sure I would mind that that much, but it seems to me a less dramatic response would just be to have proportional um, sort of granting of the electoral votes. I haven't looked at it, I haven't done the math. I'm not sure that would help Democrats or Republicans and I'm a pretty sort of staunch Democrat, but I still think it's a great idea. And I still think it would diminish the inherent democratic flaws in this structure. So more to be said about that, but I should stop. Should I stop? Because I could say something else or I could just stop. Um, okay, let's stop. Good, um, I'll stop. I'm, usually the answer to when I say I'm gonna say something else is I should stop, so I will stop. Thank you. We may get to it in the Q and A um, because we have our third panelist and he is Will Davis, the senior associate at Good Steward LLC, otherwise known as GSL. Wilbur K. Davis, is a 2020 alumnus of Hofstra University. He double majored in journalism and political science, I'm proud to say. He was one of 15 scholars selected by the American Political Science Association to participate in the Ralph Bunch Summer Institute, an intensive five-week program at Duke University over the summer of 2019. At Hofstra, Will served as president of the Zai Tsai chapter of the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity. He was awarded the Young Drum Major Award by Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Inc. Eta Theta Lambda Chapter for his community service and academic achievement. He served as a summer intern and a team leader at the Selective Corporate Internship Program in New York City. He also interned at, a, <clears throat> at NBC for MSNBC host Alex Witt and with the last word with Lawrence O'Donnell. Currently, Will is a senior associate at Good Steward LLC, uh, which has the goal of providing financial education and advisory services to consumers, increasing the presence of black employees and enterprising in US public and private sectors, payroll and supply chains, and facilitating commerce between the black business community across the African diaspora and on the African continent. Will plans on pursuing his law degree, just letting you know, and a PhD in political science. Thank you, Will, for joining us. Go right ahead. Thank you, Dr. Pry, for the introduction. I'm getting ready to share my screen here. Um, give me one second. I'm gonna go through this as quickly as possible because this is a day of dialogue and I would love to hear from students. Thank you, thank you, Professor Sample and Niles. That was awesome, um, great information and Thank you to all the students. I thank you, Dr. Pry, for, again for, for the introduction. I'm happy to be here, and I do see um, Ms. Collins in the program. Thank you for attending. And we had a program, which is actually one of the posters over here, making sense of the 2020 election at Hostra last year, where um, Basil Smichael, who's a brother of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity Incorporated, and the program had a great attendance by students students who really at, who care about um, what's happening in the country and how to make sure that their um, voices is heard. So, uh, so I wanted to get into this by saying we, my fraternity chapter uh, that I help advise had a program last week and it's how to sway an election. And I, I want to talk about this real quickly because it had over 115 students that attend. And typically when we hear about young voters, they don't, they, we hear often that they don't care about what's going on. They, they may be privileged on 
aren't voting so they don't go out and, and attend. And we really had a great res response and a great attendance to this program and involvement. That's the other thing, which I'm happy to, that we have voice of di um, dialogue today. But with this particular program, we also had a lot of dialogue on voting and how one question, which I was gonna ask to one of the law professors that came up during the program was how much does disenfranchisement account for the lower turnout in the growing population of eligible voters? And I tried to answer that during the program, but um, I'll also put that in the chat to um, ask, get a chance to have another question on the table. But um, being educated about your voter rights is important. That's clear. And it's even more clear in this upcoming election um, due to COVID-19. What we, this is some similar slides that we had during the program and a lot of people um, were very receptive to it. Early voting options, there's a, over 38 states that have um, an early voting option. There's some that already have the vote, vote by mail where you don't even have to apply. New Jersey, I'm a resident of New Jersey. We didn't have to apply for that, but I did vote before and it used to be um, a, requires no excuse to cast a ballot, which there's a lot of states here that um, in the lighter, called the middle shade blue, that require no excuse, which just means you have before, you have to register for a um, mail-in ballot, but it will, you, you'll you be able to do it without an excuse. You don't have to say like, I'm at school or uh, so, so, some other excuse where you wouldn't be able to go in person. And then there's some, some, some states like Texas here that you still need an excuse to cast your ballot even. And this was updated October 7th, 2020. So this, I kept the arrows when we did this program because it was more relevant in the days in the past yet, but it's just a pure example of also telling students, if you live in one of these states um, to also not just take this information for yourself, but also pass it along. I think it's important. And a lot of students are now seeing how important it is to reach out to your own network and um, advocate for people to not only one register to vote, but if they can, if you need to sign up for a mail-in ballot. And just to give you an example of this, uh, my chapter, my grad chapter in um, New Jersey, and I think my brother actually is on the call. He, he helped run this. Uh, we go we, for a couple of Saturdays before the deadline, we were one actually handing out masks, PPEs and um, hand sanitizer, but we were also th during the Saturdays at one of the churches who's passed by a, a brother in our fraternity. He um, has a food drive. So we, we were giving out voter registration information and we were telling people about information on how to fill out the ballot properly, even though they give you those instructions in, in the um, voting information, there's, there still can be confusion on how to fill it out properly. So it, while people were in line and waiting for it, they were receiving voter registration packets. We were giving them the proper date on when it, it's the last day to register, which was um, October 13th. And we still, um, and we also educated them on the option to mail in your ballot instead of waiting at a polling place, which because of COVID um, would have more restrictions. So. I, did, I actually don't want to take up too much time on this because I added it in there, but Professor Niles went over it extremely well. So but I did a study um, during the time at Ralph Bunch that Dr. Parati mentioned on access to voting. And in particular, because I did also hear, I always hear the same, the same talking points from a lot of people. They don't, they don't understand the, um, how restrictions can actually affect um, voter turnout and even though we do sometimes say it's a, only a driver's license or something else, they don't see the other um, components that can make that a huge, a huge sway. Even like, for example, voting lines, why a lot of people, in, and I heard um, earlier Professor Sample, I think, mention this, like New York State, we tend to think it's a liberal state, but you see six, my, one of my fraternity brothers said he waited in line five hours the other day. One person was bragging about waiting one hour and said the line went by smoothly. But again, we have to question in what function the functioning democracy is one hour 
to be proud of. So again, that's why it's, it's also good to stay educated. I know one of the older brothers also said, why didn't you guys do the absentee ballot? But there's a, a obvious reasons during this election why a lot of people are scared to mail in their ballots. But again, it would have been an easier way of voting instead of having to have to wait in line for five hours, one hour, two hours, where, where, where it may be. But pretty much, I, again, I'm not trying to spend a lot of time on this, but among race, um, among Blacks, the voting turnout in the most restrictive state, which actually I forgot to, I got this from data sets that I used, 2012 um, CCES, which is a data set on election studies from Harvard, and Dr. Hillegas and Dr. Hobbins um, ease of voting data. So they, they, what they did was they broke down into different categories, um, how long you have to wait in line, um, if they require a driver's license, things like that to go into that, um, they, into that ease of voting. So the most restricted states would have got a ranking of five, the most um, ease, the, the most states that which the least restrictions got oh, one vote. So among blacks, the voting turnout in the most restricted states is expected from what, what I got after I did a couple of tests on it um, through R was expected to be 1% less than white in the most restricted states. In the least restricted states, the turnout was expected to be one more per percentage higher than white voters. And why this is important, typically we actually do see, and I, you'll see it later on in my presentation, that blacks tend have a history recent, but most recently to vote at a higher percentage mm -hmm. than white voters. But when you see in the restrictive states where it tends to be what, where blacks have the most population, it's actually less. And then the gender, um, for, for particularly with gender, female turnout was expected to be about 3% lower than male turnout in the most restricted states. In the least restricted states, female, tur female turnout is expected to be about 0.4 higher than male turnout. So you see a huge drop in the most restricted states among women um, in voting, which could have a huge, and I'm gonna get to this part too, in the rise in American electorate, that can have a, that tends to, to vote more liberal on the liberal side, that can have a huge impact in these battleground states and these um, Southern states. And again, where now you see that there's some people saying that from Poland that Georgia is, uh, is becoming a swing, a purple state, right? You saw that in the 2018 election with Stacey Abrams, um, the governor of the election. You see Texas, they're saying it is a rise of population of Latino, Latino voters, which can make it more of a, a purple state. So these policies, even if it, from this study from 2012, even if it, it seems like it's a little, um, it's not as huge of a percentage and it make a difference going forward, if these policies are allowed to stay on board, it could have a huge um, effect on voting turnout and how the election swings. So, so my last one too, among age, um, I found that 18 to 29 year olds in states that were the most restrictive decreased about 11% compared to other voters. And the, and the younger turnout is expected to be in the least restricted states about 6% less than other voters. So in the most restricted states, 11% um, less than other voters, which excluded, no, which didn't exclude, but was the rest of the population. And in the most least restricted state is still less than other voters, but it's at 6%. So there's a huge difference between restrictive and least restrictive. And among elders, the voter turnout is expected to increase by 4% in the most restrictive states and 6% in the least restrictive states. So elders get affected even at, at it as a small percentage, but you can see how the increase actually in the most restrictive states, um, it, it shows that how when, when you look at it among young people, they get hit 18 to 29 population, you, the, you, the youth get hit at a higher rate, and then the older population is still being reflected in their vote. So they're still getting out there, even among these types of barriers, which could have a huge sway on how the election um, goes. So why does this matter? Again, in 2016, this was from 2012, but in 2016, you see out of the two population among race, Black had a huge decrease 
um, it was above that 65% and it went down to 59.6, it's from Pew Research. Um, and the other race that went down was Hispanic. It was around the 48, 49 mark and it slightly went down to 47.6. But then when we talk about millennials um, I and Gen X, they did the study, um, the millennial and Gen X population voter turnout increased, but among millennials, the black popular turnout decreased, right? And it was the only decrease that we saw in 2016 compared to um, 2012. So, so again, why does this matter? The rise in American electorate, uh, which includes unmarried women, millennials, ages 18 to 34, African-Americans, Latinos, and other people of color as defined by the census, census excuse me, 2016, it was 59.2. In 2020, it's now 64%, which would be 150 million people in this country. And again, this population tends to vote a certain way. It's no guarantee, but you could clearly see how these voting laws can affect, um, affect this population and why that now continues to matter. So in the program, we went over that, but we also wanted people to understand how they can be more of an informed voter. And I know the time I want to get to questions, I'm still gonna click on it and just show you an example of how I can find who my elected officials are. So but, and during, the, during, the, um, during the program, we actually asked people and they were giving us the address to search up. So who represents me currently, not, not on the ballot, but who are my current politicians? I would go down to Ballotpedia. It used to be easier, it used to be on the side. They, I guess for the election, they stopped that. But I would type in my address. You only need your um, number and your zip code. You don't have to put your email on and it's loading your elected officials. So it, obviously it'll, it'll show your president, vice president, Congress, uh, statewide office. I'm not gonna click on that because it's a long list. Um, but New York State Senate, Richard Cody, um, Assembly District, John McKean, Mila Jassy, and then Essex County is a long list, and then the courts here. So the, the reason why I explain this information, I'm going through it as quickly as possible, but I really want you guys to go on and check it yourselves. It, when, in particular, when we're looking at um, these, the, not the camp, but your elected officials, right? And I'm also gonna show you how what's on your ballot is how you can check who's running. But when you look at your elected officials, to be an informed voter and to be an informed citizen, you have to first know their names, but then two, you have to then do your own research on them, right? And that's why I encourage a lot of younger voters. And I think that also helps them get into the process of voting more, right? When they know, um, what, what they're voting for and who they're voting for and they become more informed voters, they, they have more pride in voting and they're not as, um, they, don't, they don't say as much that this is not gonna work for me. And even if they do say they're not gonna do anything for me, they'll understand that what the consequences of maybe not voting is compared to what the consequence, what the benefit slash consequence would be to vote, right? So on my ballot, I have three ballot measures that I already um, submitted in anyway, but there's question one, question two, question three. And if you click on these, they'll give you a detailed report on what each would do, right? Which, which kind of is on your ballot too, but this will give you even more, ballot P will give you even more research that was done. And actually during the program that we had last week, what, we did a Massachusetts ballot. And one of the questions, um, one of my, and I think says on the call, he read it out to, to them and explain what it was. And then the person who address it was, she actually knew about the ballot measure and explained how it was different from what it appeared. So that even emphasized even more why we continue to, why we need to continue to do our research on these ballot measures. She, she totally, she totally said that what it was, what it says it intends to do is not what will actually happen. If it, and so she informed us more on that, which is why it's important to have these programs one, but also to do your research. So the presidential ticket you have here, you have Congress, my district 11, with Mickey Sherrill, who's a Democratic incumbent, and Rosemary Belshi. Um, you have 
Cory Booker, and then the other Senate ticket, Christopher Durkin, the S County clerk, and uh, the freeholders position, which you elect four of them, and the other freeholder district. So for example, I'm gonna do this real quick. If I wanted to look up, since she's an incumbent, Mickey Sherrill, what, what has she voted on? I would go to causes.com, which is, which is uh, for senators and House of Representatives. Um, I would search her name and lawmakers. So I already signed in, right? So if you don't have an account, you can look her up by, or look up your current one by searching it and then going to lawmakers and clicking on it. But I want to see, for example, what bills she's voted on that I really care about. So let's see. Um, I'll go down to, let's say, should the federal government give local education agencies um, funding to make changes to districts aimed at increasing racial and so social economic diversity? So I'll go here. Since I'm already logged on, which is why if you can to make an account, it passed the House. It didn't get a vote on the Senate, and it wasn't active. But she did vote. It had 248 yays, 167 days. It was introduced May 8th, 2019. And what this website also does, it gives you a first a summary of the bill. It gives you opinions on in favor and opposed. You can vote, you can say yay or nay, and you can also write a comment about your opinion. And when I I did I did this often, it has to impact, it has to sometimes the cost. So it says 89 million and it'll give you more information. It was introduced by Representative Marsha Fudge and has 105 co-sponsors. But when I went through this website and used to write my opinions on it, you get letters back, you get emails back from, sometimes it's automated messages, but other times you may get the office on this, on this website. So Causes directly helps link from you, your, the, um, actual constituent to your to your representative and they'll give maybe if it is automated response where they stand on this issue so it's a really good um, website and tool to use just to say stay informed and my last thing i'm gonna go i actually have two little things sorry so i, I know part of this was what can we do to encourage young people to vote um again i love this graphic especially what a lot of young people be into activism. Um, it's like going to the McDonald's and getting French fries, 99% potato, 1% salt, but voting is like that, the 1% of activism, you'll notice when it's missing, right? So even when we ha do have people that say that their vote doesn't matter, you can tell between two, um, two, the two party system, which side, wherever side you are, you can, there is a huge difference. So that's um, one graphic that I saw circling around, especially the young population that I love because it, one, I don't think it does what a lot of people really hate in the young population is voting shaming, but it, does, it gives you more of a different take on it and it puts it into perspective. And, and so actually I did have a couple more points real quick on that. Um, so for example, when I was talking to one of my friends about voting, she said that <laughs> she's in New York and she said she may not be voting just recently because she heard that the polls were taking four to five um, hours, right? And instead of saying like a, and I've talked about my, my, I see my older generation of black people always go, how can you say that? That's a privileged position. I mean, we're gonna die, vote or die, right? Instead of saying that to her, I also educated her on the fact that she could have already had her ballot in, even if she didn't trust the mailing process, she could have taken it down to the courthouse and had her, um, and it will be there, right? You, you. So again, for the next election, I still encourage her to vote right in this election, but for the next election, it will be, a, do that, do the mailing. I think New York state now had uh, turned into a no excuse state, correct me if I'm wrong, if, if that is, but for New Jersey, for example, you could submit it um, days, 45 days, I believe, um, the election happened. So again, we, we don't have to wait in the line. We, we can, and we don't have to voter shame. We can inform them. By a couple quick points, I said, be prepared for dialogue and be open to it. And also it is important to listen, right? Because a lot of people, a lot of younger people have a right to be frustrated with how the system is going, right? You just, a lot of people 
younger people majority voted for one side and then you see what's happening today that could um be very discouraging but having programs like how to sway election that my fraternity did it meets them where they're at so even with the graphic it is important for us to create something that was contemporary that related to people a lot of people know that um kendrick lamar album that we just did the, the cover to and add the ballots that got more people to share the flyer and it also got more people to comment on like, oh, this is a dope flyer. Like, when's the event? Even though the event time set it on there, right? So um, I, I also stress mentoring and supporting younger people in any way you can as we need um, competent leaders as, as we see, because right now it kind of gets muddled when you see not just in the media space, but you see in the, um, as elected officials, how the arguments tend to be one side versus the other and a lot of people get tired. So we do need those leaders in our life to come help us explain these types of things. And um, talk to your younger people in your life about public affairs, I think uh, politics in general, right? I think, especially, I mean, I see in the university at while I was at Hofstra, sometimes in classes, um, professors were afraid to even address politics. But I feel like, again, this, a lot of people, a lot of people who, actually had, we, we had those passionate discussions, they ended up saying, I never thought about it like this. Oh, I may have to vote. Oh, I regret doing, not sitting out for this. I'll encourage other people to vote while I vote. So it gives people more hope and it gives people more of a, a uh, encouragement to do that. And then my last point before I do this quick video is encourage voting on all elections, not just presidential and midterm generals. I often see the voting drives come all the time during the general election of a presidential year or a midterm year when the candidates for both parties have been decided. And people say, well, I don't have a choice. that I have to vote for either two. Well, you, most people did have a choice in the primary. We just are, and sometimes a, you, like a state like New Jersey, we're one of the last ones. So I'm always in pain when after the it was already decided for me. But there's a lot of states that could have had an impact if younger voters went out in the primaries and voted instead of um, not knowing about it and we didn't encourage it during the primaries, right? And the, now the general election comes and your party may suffer from it if you didn't encourage it in the primaries because now they're sitting out saying, wait, we didn't pick this candidate. My last th thing about that, and it's a very important thing, is that studies have already shown that when people vote, all when they make it a habit they don't even think about it they're voting like i like i've voted ever since i turned 18 i mailed in my ballot in 2016 i actually took it down to the courthouse because because i was at hostra and i didn't fill it out in time and knew that it wouldn't make it there so i i brought it down i took the train over and brought it down to the courthouse but if you stress it to young people to vote in every election and make it a habit for them right bring them to before my parents would bring me to the voting booth. Bring, bring them and show them that you you take voting seriously, they'll also take it seriously. So this is my last video. I, it's an um, inspirational video. This is from the 1964 um, election. Dr. King was talking about voting. So it's a one minute clip. We get, and then we can get into questions, I guess, after. I come here to earn. You guys can hear that, right? Yes, I yes. My, okay, thank you. Every person under the sound of my voice to go to the polls on the 3rd of November and vote your conviction. Suffice it to say that we stand in one of the most momentous periods of human history. And in these days of emotional tension, when the problems of the world are gigantic in extent and chaotic in detail, all men of goodwill must make the right decisions. Whether America will take the high road of justice and peace, compassion for the poor and underprivileged, or whether this nation will tread the low road of man's inhumanity to man of injustice, of short-sightedness, So thank you. Thank and you. I look forward to hear your questions. <laughs>
Thank you, Will. It's amazing that election day of 1964 was also November 3rd. And so right, right. real audio from Dr. King. Um, we're gonna go right into questions. We have a bit to, uh, to ask about that. We have a, I'm gonna ask you to raise your hands in the participant box and also to ask us questions in the chat. And I already have some questions queued up in the chat. Uh, from Professor Labresco, we have a question for Professor Sample. Um, what, were, what, what were in particular or have been some problems in New York State regarding um, voter suppression? So, you know, most, for the most part, we think of New York uh, State and particularly New York City as uh, a place that is uh, diverse and that embraces diversity, but actually um, in numerous counties, certainly um, I, off the top of my head, I know that Manhattan and the Bronx are two of the counties. I believe Kings County is another of the, of the counties that's in the city um, that was a covered jurisdiction. There were, you know, I mean, a lot of times, historically speaking, um, you know, what we think of as the, the current political alliances that exist between um, communities of color and political parties, um, you know, have changed quite a bit over the years and they, they've been anything but static. Um, and so New York has historically had problems. New, Long Island um, has, as many people at Hofstra know better than I, um, you know, many communities on Long Island have had significant issues with regard to race and housing practices and things like that. So, you know, it's a reminder, if anything else, if nothing else, that um, we all have a responsibility to, to, whether it's in voting rights or in any other aspect of race relations, to, to not just be non-racist, but to be anti-racist. Another um, uh, correspondent here, Lauren uh, Ballinger asks, do you think that the quick confirmation of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court will significantly impact the 2020 election? And I might add to that, um, the controversies about voting methods surrounding um, the 2020 election. And this is for both of uh, the law professors. Mark? How will uh, Con Amy Coney Barrett being on the court affect the election? Yeah. Well, it's assuming the election is close enough and there are any disputes in any particular states, um, that might get up to the Supreme Court. Certainly, as one of the nine justices, she could have a significant impact. So, I am. I was a law professor already in 2000 when the Bush versus Gore dispute happened, and the Supreme Court ultimately decided the election by ordering the vote stopped in Florida. Florida was engaged in a recount, uh, and a lawsuit was filed by members of the Bush but the members of the Bush campaign. He wasn't president yet to have the vote stopped and ultimately got the Supreme Court in a 5-4 vote along sort of partisan lines in terms of who had appointed the justices, concluded that for a combination of reasons, the vote had to be stopped. So if we were to get to a point where um, there was a dispute about the voting practices or the counting of absentee votes or uh, some other issue that related to the election uh, and it got away to the Supreme Court, then yeah, she would have one among uh, nine votes. Um, I, again, if you're cynical enough to think it's just going to be based on purely political grounds, there are already five votes, so she would be the sixth vote. Um, but so, yes, yeah, she would have an impact assuming the election is close enough as it was in 2000 that a dispute in a state or states could impact the election. So, I guess that's my sense of that. Um, again, to uh, folks here, Raise your hand in the in the uh, participant box if you'd like. Um, I'm going to throw. I see one uh, question there, but I'm going to jump to one other question in the chat. Um, understanding the growing importance of the youth vote, have any states implemented restrictions to make it difficult for students to register to vote? And that's an especially pandemic-related uh, question too. I think. Um, either do any of you want to tackle that one? You know, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. I, you know, I don't think that, I don't know of any states that have enacted measures that are particularly aimed 
at um, young people, although there are states that have um, been more proactive in encouraging young people to vote. So uh, particularly with in states with heavy um, or significant college populations, you see some states with what I would call progressive voting laws that have things like same day voter registration. So, um, you know, you, if you, you can live on college campus and, and go to the polls because you get inspired at the last minute and you do things at the last minute the way a, you know, 21 year old often does, uh, those are measures that can encourage voting. You know, Professor Niles mentioned um, the, the gun permit ID in Texas. You know, it was interesting that the, the, the gun permit uh, ID that he mentioned, 91% of the people in Texas, uh, when that law was passed, uh, who had those gun permit um, licenses were white. Um, and Texas chose to allow that kind of ID, but it specifically disallowed student IDs um, and it, state employee IDs and other IDs that younger people and persons of color would be more likely to have. So, um, you know, I, I think that um, the, the best antidote to all of that is the work that people like uh, Wilbert are doing. I mean, I, Will, I thought that presentation was just amazing. And I, I think that that is, you know, that is exactly what, Amer what you're doing is what America needs. I, I would just add really quickly, the, all those things and longer voting time. So in many of the larger um, uh, democracies in the world, the notion of having one day for voting or even a couple days for voting uh, is anathema. So the longer period that people can have to vote, the more likely it is you're gonna get people to vote. And again, cross lines, Republicans, Democrats, independents, uh, the objective should be to have as many people vote as possible. And that's another way to get that done. Um, Janice, Janice Fu, you have a hand up in the box. Yes, I do. I'm, I apologize for my question. It's really stupid because this, um, this is my first time voting. So I have no idea what I'm doing. And all I did was try to internet all the ask the internet all these questions but I just want to confirm I want my I my what my idea was to drop in my absentee ballot because I was under a weird circumstance so I didn't know if I can hand in my ballot physically or send it in person um I was just moving around from place to place but I lost my envelope that came with the ballot yeah. and I I don't I want to know how to do it properly that way I increase my chance of having my ballot uh, approved. And are you a New Yorker, Janice? Yes. So I think probably, I mean, I, you know, hesitant to give advice on this other than to say that um, the safest option by far, if you can manage it between now, really between now and Friday um, would be to go directly to a local county board of elections and try and drop it off in person, but it, but actually speak to a person there. Um, for example, you know, if they could provide a, an external envelope or if the situation could be remedied I th and put you at ease that the ballot would be counted, I think, um, you know, that would be the, the safest route. Certainly. Is there another route? Cause like I, I would do that, but um, I, I cannot drive for medical reasons. So I think that was that's the major problem why I'm having trouble with um, submitting my ballot. I think you should probably call them. Call them to find out what you should do. Thank you. That would be my advice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we this session is formally over at five fifty five. But if the um, panelists would um, entertain staying after for about five more minutes for any additional questions, I, I can do that. Um, so but we do understand if students need to get to a class. Um, and if you have to depart students, then please feel free to but we, we might just go till six o'clock. Um, we have a question um, that was written in the in, in the chat. Um, how can we protect ourselves from violence at the polls? And this really, this comes from a student, Alicia Riggs, and it um, actually raises another question that I've had um, that I'd like to kind of tag onto Alicia's question. What do you think are the prospects of passing a law at the national level to address some of these things that have cropped up in the states, like, um, so, you know, ballot security measures um, put into place by well, the campaigns or the parties, um, you know, voter intimidation. Is there any prospect, do you think, 
that we can return um, maybe after January or at some other time to um, enact national legislation to address some of these things that have been happening, establish more parameters for um, action in, at the state level. Mark, do you want to start? Or I, I love this question, but you go first. <laughs> well, let me say quickly, because I want to hear what your response is, James. And also, Wilbert, I'd be interested. You seem to know more about politics than I do. So I'd be interested to, to know what you think the prospects are. All I would say is, generally in our history, voting has been a very local and a very state-based um, sort of procedure. I think there would be, therefore, reluctance on some parts in terms of the political spectrum to having too many federal rules or regulations about voting. That would be one of the responses that you would see. Uh, my sense is, depending on what happens over the next week or so, if there are dramatic issues that are raised, there would certainly potentially be uh, political motivation around addressing it. But it was it's going to be in a context that traditionally has been pretty reluctant to allow for a lot of federal regulation. So, okay, so I'll jump in on that, but I first, I wanna also uh, report a little bit. We have breaking news on the day of dialogue, um, compliments of one of the participants who just sent me this message. Um, just now at 5.52 p.m., the Supreme Court rejected the refiled um, petition in the Pennsylvania case in which the Pennsylvania um, Republican Party and the state legislature were trying for the second time to block the extended ballot deadline. And to Dr. Parati's earlier question, um, all, all I have here on the report, and I thank Dolores Chichi for it, is um, Supreme Court rejects Pennsylvania Republicans' second attempt to block extended ballot deadline. Justice Barrett did not participate in deliberations over the case. So at least on that one case, um, the 4-4 um, ruling or 4-4 decision not to stay, not to block um, that ballot deadline, the Pennsylvania in Pennsylvania, uh, presuming that there aren't um, yet further developments, which there may well be, but it appears now that uh, those who postmark their ballots by election day and where the ballots are received three days um, uh, within three days of the election will be counted. Uh, and I see from uh, Jacob Manzur, a Hofstra University and law school alum, that the vote was five to three um, with Justice Kavanaugh joining. So um, that is a, a development. And to Dr. Parati's question, um, I, I mean, we, we try very hard in an academic setting not to be partisan in our answers, but I think there's a really clear answer to the question, which is that if the Democrats win the presidency the, the House and the Senate, there's a real chance. And if they don't win all three of those, there is zero chance. And that's what we've seen for, um, you know, I, and, I, and the reality is that states in particular, we don't have one system of elections. We don't even have 50 systems of elections. We have something approaching 10,000 systems of elections in the United States. And for years and years, every time I hear the word infrastructure, my brain doesn't go to bridges and roads and trains and all of that. I mean, those are wonderful things, but we need to invest in the infrastructure of our democracy and grow, coming out of the pandemic era with states facing massive de deficits, we're even less positioned than we've ever been to invest in infrastructure and to make more uniform some of those protections. Um, you know, and, and you know, the reality of the election that we're about, that we're experiencing right now and that we'll experience in a concentrated way on Tuesday, you know, plexiglass isn't free, um, you know, the, for, the, for these election boards and all that. Our election system is being held together by duct tape and Elmer's glue. And if we escape without a catastrophe, it's because we got lucky, not because we were prepared. Will, you want to weigh in? I think we can move on to that. I love those answers. So we can, <laughs> if you have any more questions before. Okay. Um, uh, there is, I have one other question. Um, the question, do, do you think there actually will be voter fraud now that there is more mail-in voting? Do you think that it's actually more likely that there, there might be voter fraud because of widespread um, 
is uh, mail-in voting this time around? So let me start. Um, I know one instance, there is one instance, and it's interesting that it was uh, in favor of a Republican candidate of what's called voter harvesting or vote harvesting in North Carolina in a congressional election. Uh, one person, I think, or people who were working with that one person went around and essentially either paid people or took from people their ballots and then used those ballots to vote for the candidate that that person was ostensibly working for. Uh, and that person that was identified and James, you may remember exactly what happened. I think there was a special election called or something, or it was identified an issue. Yeah. I would think that, that that is a possibility. The reality though is I think in large part in response to that instance, it states have implemented all kinds of things to try to address that. And the, the young woman who called concerned about how her ballot was going to be impacted. Uh, she is an example of the kinds of hoops you have to go through and issues you have to address to try to avoid that sort of thing. So I would imagine the track record in our country is that voter fraud, again, is incredibly uncommon. If someone was really that brazen and that sort of forceful in trying to do it, I think the existing um, restrictions and limitations would probably make that very difficult. But if there was going to be voter fraud, that's about the only way I can imagine it happening arising out of um, the extension of mail-in voting. It, it, the, yeah, when, when Professor Niles earlier said it's a solution in search of a problem, I think that's, that's the synopsis. I mean, the reality is um, every, th that we have fewer instances of voter fraud than we do of instances of people being killed by lightning strikes each year, literally. And the reality is it would be amazing if we could somehow come up with a plan that would protect every single one of us from ever getting struck by lightning. And But if we were to build a dome over the entire nation, we could probably pr protect against getting struck by lightning, but it might have some negative consequences like, I don't know, photosynthesis being ruined. That's where we are with a lot of these measures that are suppressing thousands of votes to get at a problem that might ultimately be statistically not even one or two votes. Great analogy. Um, I want to thank everyone for coming. We've reached the six o'clock hour and I know that students have places to go and um, professors have places to go. We are so grateful to all of you for making the time for preparing your presentations. Um, for putting in the time in, in Will's case to, um, to really walk the walk and get and, and help inform younger voters to participate more and better. Uh, I, it's a real inspiration to us to do the same thing, you know, on an ongoing basis. Thanks to all of you and safe travels to you. And if you haven't gotten that absentee ballot in the mail or over there to the Board of Elections, Time to do it. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Doug. Thanks, everybody. And Thank Will, you. I'll be applying for a job from you someday, Sid. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> oh, appreciate it. Have a great one, everyone. Uh, um, oops, we just lost James. Okay. Ciao. Ciao to all. <laughs> <laughs>